All right. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Carolyn Caffrey Gardner. Hi. I'm one of the librarians here um, at CSUDH Library, where I coordinate our instructional programming. And I am joined today by my colleague, Dana Ospina. I think she's on mute right now. Hello, everyone. And uh, you'll be hearing from us today about navigating journal publishing. So um, what this presentation is going to cover, we're going to talk a little bit about criteria you may want to keep in mind when you are um, figuring out and selecting a journal to publish your research in as well as talking about sort of evaluating that journal's publication processes itself, thinking about how it's peer reviewed, to what extent, as well as where it might appear in the resource. And we'll dive in a little bit into journal metrics that can be used to evaluate different resources. And um, we'll also then dive into author agreements and copyright. All right, so first, some questions to consider. You probably have questions in mind um, when you're thinking about your own research, and these are just some that we recommend um, from a scholarly communication angle here in the library. Um, so first and foremost, obviously, what's the disciplinary scope of that particular journal? Um, as great as a journal may be, it may be the top-ranked journal in your field or your colleagues really value it, um, but of course, if it focuses on something wildly different, than what your research is interested in, it's never going to be the perfect fit. Um, so we really encourage you to think about the disciplinary scope of the journal, um, looking at either maybe past issues they've published, um, other articles, is there anything you're citing in your own research that comes from this particular publication? And also, you know, um, who might be reading this journal in terms of the disciplinary scope? For some of the research you may be doing, you may want to purposely seek out a journal outside of maybe your core discipline area, um, something that's interdisciplinary or um, has that cross-disciplinary scope, depending on what your research is. So that's obviously, first and foremost, most important in selecting a publication to publish your research. Um, but another question you may want to consider is how will readers find your work? Some journals have larger mm, distribution than others. They are more readily available, whether that's through a commercial database like we subscribe to in the library, whether it's um, sort of just a larger company and brand name, maybe it shows up more places. Um, and that might be something that's really important to you, how readers, how accessible it actually is to them. Um, but maybe not even just how accessible, but who? Do you care about readers maybe in other countries? Do you want to pick a journal that has a more international audience? Um, do you want readers who focus maybe on uh, policy? And you, know, you want to make sure that your work gets in front of them as well. Um, so really thinking about how readers will find your work is something you should consider when selecting a publication venue. Then of course, you know, what's the reputation of the journal in your field? And when we look at journal metrics, we'll go over a few ways that you can determine quantitatively some parts of the reputation, perhaps, of your journal. But really, a great way to do this is ask your colleagues. Um, when you're at a conference, you know, where are those people coming from and where do they publish? And um, how, how much do you respect their particular research? What do your maybe more senior colleagues in your department or other peer researchers that you value, um, where do they recommend publishing? What do they think of particular journals? So much of it, uh, reputation is very much word of mouth and community driven. And then you will also want to consider what rights you retain as an author. Um, and Dana will talk more about that as well. So I want to show you two resources where you can um, really look up some of these, uh, some of this information, right? You're not a librarian. You maybe don't know, well, who does read this journal? How can I find it? So we have two paid resources here in the library that can help you figure that out. Um, and you can find both of them on the article databases link um, on the library's homepage. So they're right underneath the one search bar. You're going to see article databases. And I've listed them both here. The first one is Cabell's directories, and the second one is called Ulrich's. All right, um, so this is Cabell's. It's one of the resources we have here in the library. Now, it doesn't have every journal in the world, doesn't have every discipline, but this can be a great place to start because you're going to find all kinds of information. 
Um, when you first click into Cabell's, you land on the whitelist. These are journals that meet different kinds of ethical standards, and Cabell's has chosen to include them in their resource. Now, the resources that Cabell's covers tends to be health sciences, some select social sciences in the area of business or education, and then life and biomedical sciences. So it's not going to be everything, um, but you may be able to find some of this information on the individual publisher's website for these journals as well. They also include some other services here, including a list of publications they believe engage in some unethical practices, um, which you can search there as well. So um, you can search by individual title, or if you're still kind of thinking about, gosh, where do I want to actually publish my work, um, you can actually just browse by a particular discipline. Um, so I'm just going to click into something that I feel like I know, and that's going to just be libraries, right? I'll just pick one category. I'll do academic librarianship. Um, so you can actually browse by a particular discipline, browse by the type of peer review, or search an individual title. When you're looking at your results, it does sort by title automatically. I don't know why. It's just alphabetical. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and scroll down, find one that potentially interests me. All right, I'll look at this one. So when you click on a particular publication, you get a little bit more information about it. Um, so in this case, most of this information is directly provided by the publisher um, to Cabell's. So you, you do want to take it with a little grain of salt. Um, for if I was going to submit an article to college and research libraries, it's in the field of ed tech library science. It's been around since 1939, so I know that it has you know, a pretty long history, um, which I might care about in the reputation for my field. And then I can see more about um, oh, well, the chances my particular research study has in getting in this journal. So um, they're relatively short, 3,000 to 6,000 words is the average length of their manuscripts. They have very few invited articles, so I know that you know, they're mostly soliciting competitive peer-reviewed pieces. Their acceptance rate is 31%, um, and this is usually an annual acceptance rate. And then their peer review process is double blind. So I know that um, I'm going to have reviewers who don't know who I am and vice versa. That might be something I want to tell my RTP committee in particular. I know I've screenshotted the section of Cabell's and included it in my own tenure portfolio. They include four reviewers. So my article is going to be reviewed by at least four people. Two of them are going to come internal, IMT, from likely the editorial board. And two are going to come external, other peers who do research in this field. Now it is going to take those four people, honestly not that long for four people, two to three months to review. However, it's going to take me over a year to actually get to publication according to college and research libraries. I would say my experience is this um, time to publication is on the quick side since that data is provided by the publisher. They do provide peer review comments back to you. They don't do any automatic plagiarist screeners um, using software like Turnitin. So already I have a ton of information about this particular journal, and I can also quickly get to the journal's website to see more about it um, if I want to submit. Let me click on one more. The other thing um, that Cabell's will do is they have some metrics where they'll tell you, you know, just in general, how great the reputation is, how difficult is it, what kind of tier would they rank this journal in. Um, library science is a pretty small field, so you know these numbers are not particularly illuminating, but depending on your field, you may see um, it'll say like first tier, second tier, um, but not every discipline is in here as well. So that is Cabell's. It's a pretty cool resource, and again, this is something that's really great to maybe share with RTP committees or with other kinds of grant reviewers or anybody who you want to kind of show off your particular publication. I have another example on the screen, um, which I hope you can all see, <laughs> um, of, uh, in this case, Adoption Quarterly, and a psychology and education um, focused journal, um, which looks a little bit different. So the other place where you can find information, particularly about how your readers are going to find this, who's going to read this, is going to be in the Ulrich's periodical directory. This is a paid resource, again, available through the library's databases. Um, I'm going to click into it. You can find it also in the database link. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and type in another title here. I'm drawing on my own field, but of course you can type in, you know, anything you are interested in. Now Cabell's is going to have basically every journal. If it has an ISSN assigned to it, it will be in Cabell's. And it's predominantly used by libraries and other resources to purchase journals. Um, and so the resources in here, it's not the prettiest looking resource, but it is gonna tell you a lot about who has access to this particular publication. So here I have the Journal of Academic Librarianship, the one that I typed in. I'm gonna click in and see a little bit more about it. So you get additional information about the journal, how it's classified. We know it's a library science journal. My favorite section and the section that I think will be of most use to you is the abstracting and indexing. And this is what I really recommend Ulrichs for. Um, you can, however, use Ulrichs to verify that a journal as a whole is peer reviewed. Um, you'll also find that, you know, of course, on the journal's website, but um, Ulrichs also will tell you whether or not a journal is refereed or reviewed. And in this case, this one is. Under that abstracting and indexing section or the online availability, this is where my readers are gonna be able to potentially access and find this journal. Something I personally am looking for are, um, when I publish my research, is a place where other librarians are gonna be able to find it. Um, that it is indexed in a lot of places that are reputable so that I know um, other researchers like me can find and cite my work. So here, mostly what you're gonna see are commercial databases, some of which we may own here at Dominguez Hills, some of which you may have never heard about. Um, so in this case, this particular journal is in a lot of different EBSCO databases, including some of the key library science databases that I use in my own work, as well as affiliated disciplines like education. Uh, so that makes me pretty happy. I know readers, if they have an institution that they're working at, and they have a library, they're likely gonna have one of these EBSCO resources, so they're definitely gonna find my work. Um, and of course, it looks like it's also indexed in several ProQuest databases and a few other places, so I'm pretty stoked with this. This is a little bit different than um, Google Scholar. Google Scholar doesn't sort of like officially index any type of publication. It has to do with the metadata that's scraped off the PDF. Um, so it's not something a journal has to apply to get indexed in or not. Um, so you'll notice that it's not usually listed in these particular lists. You may also notice if you've ever received solicitations, particularly over email, asking you to publish your work, it'll sometimes list resources it's indexed in. Um, some of which you may have never heard of before or are not quite an official resource, but sounds similar enough. So Ulrichs is definitely a place where you can verify that claims a journal makes about who can read it are accurate and true. Um, and it tells us a little bit about print resources as well, if that's something that's important in your discipline. Um, and same thing with online availability. Lots of people can access this particular resource. So it's probably a good one for me. Questions about Ulrichs? Ulrichs is gonna cover, again, most, most all disciplines. Um, so let me go ahead and switch back to my slides. All right, should be back on my slides. I think I'm getting the hang of it. Um, so those are resources that you can use to sort of determine, help answer you some of those questions about the peer review process, as well as where readers will find your work. Um, of course, the journal's website itself um, under submission information is gonna have some material as well. These are just places where you can double check those claims. Um, but there are lots of different ways that you can measure the impact or reputation of a journal within your field. A lot of these tools, um, they're almost all quantitative, and a lot of them rely on citation. Um, so calculating citation impact in different ways. How often, how often over time, how often and where. <laughs> it's usually uh, some sort of formula related to that. And the key with any kind of citation metric, so if you've ever heard of journal impact factor, or maybe some of these other metrics, it's extremely important to calculate journals within a discipline. So library science, just my discipline, it's small. It's never gonna have the same sort of citation reach or the large numbers that, for example, medicine will. Um, so it wouldn't be fair to compare those, comparing apples and you know, pineapples, not even oranges. <laughs> you do wanna compare like with like. 
at Dominguez Hills, we have access to two free resources to help you find those journal metrics. Um, one that you may have experienced in your graduate programs or other universities is something called a uh, journal impact factor. That is a proprietary measure from um, Web of Science, and it's not something we subscribe to here at Dominguez Hills. Um, however, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to share um, towards the end of the presentation. So the two we do recommend are Symago. It's developed by Web of Science's competitor. So it's a competitive uh, quantitative metric to journal impact factor. And this is, again, not every journal, but most journals within the social sciences and sciences and um, a decent chunk of the humanities, but not as much as the social sciences or sciences. Um, these are journals, if it's found in the Scopus database, it will be in Symago, and they provide a list of rankings by discipline and then a journal's H index. So I'm going to click into Symago. All right, so you should be looking now at a screen of a Symago page on College and Research Libraries, one of the journals we looked at. Um, if you don't see that, uh, let me know. Okay. <laughs> so um, college and research libraries, we looked at it previously, and we're seeing the H index here. This is a number used to tell readers and to tell people evaluating this journal how influential it is when it comes to citation. So what it means is college and research libraries has 47 articles that have been cited at least 47 times. And usually the H index is calculated over a two year period. Um, so you might see this ranging quite a bit. It has to depend on, of course, how many articles are out there <laughs> for them to uh, have, but also tries to give you a perspective on citation overall. Some other metrics, if a, you know, we have one rock star article and it's been cited thousands and thousands of times, it can really kind of skew the metrics. And so the H index is really developed to try and tell you as a whole how um, influential these articles are when it comes to being cited again. Now it also will give you different quartiles and it will give you the history. You know, this journal has been around since the 30s. It's in the top quartile and it has been consistently according to these metrics. You can also get a lot of other helpful data, you know, how many total citations in each, ish, in each annual volume um, versus how many are self-cites to the same publication how many, um, how, what percentage of publications have international authors as well, if that's something that's really important to me and my discipline, um, things like that. You can also look um, up an individual journal, as I mentioned, or you can look at journal rankings in an entire discipline. Um, so we'll just pick something towards, towards the top alphabetically. I know we don't have crop science here, but I'm clicking it. Uh, so, in 2008, um, these were sort of the top journals in crop science according to Symago, and it's doing it a little bit by H index, but you'll notice the highest H index isn't necessarily at the top. They also include some of these other metrics like total self sites, how many documents are available to cite, and so on. Um, and they give the different quartiles there, and I can keep going and going and going. I can also look at where a journal is published. Perhaps I want to limit you know, crop science journals in Latin America, maybe that's relevant to my research and that's an area I want to publish. These might be the journals that I want to look at. So broadly, that is Symago. Um, Google Scholar, which I listed on the slides, I'm going to show you that now. All right, we're in Google Scholar. Great. Um, so Google Scholar, um, well, not an official sort of indexing service, you don't apply to get in, um, they do collect some of their own data when it comes to the H index. They are calculating H index, so how many times articles in that journal have been cited within the past five years. You can find this in Google Scholar um, by clicking the little hamburger menu and going to metrics and viewing different categories or even just searching for a publication. I'll just do humanities. Let me do film. So here you can see that um, of journals that are available in Google Scholar, Cinema Journal is sort of number one right here in terms of their H index. So in the past five years, they had 15 articles cited at least 15 times. Um, and that's going to be wildly different from, say, 
oh, just overall, nature. 368 articles in the past five years cited at least 368 times. Very, very different disciplines. So those are just a few ways that you can sort of um, demonstrate quantitatively the impact of your particular publication um, and something you may want to consider when selecting a place to publish. I'm going to go ahead and turn my screen over to Dana right now, who will um, continue on talking about copyright and author agreements and all of those things right there. Wonderful. So I'm going to pick up where Carolyn left off in the sense that now you've had an opportunity to evaluate a journal and you've maybe submitted a manuscript and happy day it's been accepted. And this is actually a really important part of the process because here again you're going to have the opportunity to have some agency over your work. Carolyn mentioned earlier um, author rights and that's what we're going to be talking about for the next um, portion of this presentation. What happens within an author, author agreements actually, I should say, are what you enter into with a publisher when they agree to publish your work. And when we're thinking about the publishing landscape, it varies from very traditional publishers to open access publishers. And you can imagine that within that variance, there is also a lot of difference between what publishers are going to provide by way of author's rights. So agreements may vary widely. I do want to mention, before getting to copyright basics, that many scholars are under the impression that author agreements are non-negotiable. And this is, it can be true, but it often isn't. Sometimes you, it may be such an important journal for you to publish in that you're going to forego having any negotiation with a publisher who has a very restrictive agreement, simply because the priority is to publish in that journal. But oftentimes, you are able to claim back or maintain some of the rights that a publisher would traditionally take when you sign an author agreement. And it's good to know that publishers often just assume a bundle of rights that they have no interest in exercising. So negotiations can oftentimes be very fruitful for authors because you can get back rights that you might want to use that an author, uh, I'm sorry, that a publisher was never intending on using anyway. And when we discuss author rights, we're primarily, but not exclusively, talking about rights in the area of copyright. So I'm just going to go over very basically your rights under copyright. Copyright is a complicated area and we don't have the time today to really delve in, but just some of the basics of copyright. One thing to know is that when you create a work, scholarly, creative, otherwise, copyright immediately vests with you as the creator. So while there are reasons, and if you're interested in knowing them, I can talk to you um, after the webinar or at another point, there are reasons to register with the Copyright Office. This is not necessary for many authors, and it's certainly not necessary to do so in order to have your work under copyright. When your work comes under copyright, your rights broadly include the right to reproduce your work, the right to distribute it, the right to make derivative works from that, from that original work, the right to display and perform your work, and the right to authorize anyone else to do any of these things with your work, which is essentially what you're doing when you are signing an author agreement that transfers all of your copyright. Copyright lasts a long time. For any work um, created post-1978, it's the life of the author plus 70 years. So that's quite a long time. So I mentioned that author agreements can vary widely. And while there are many permutations, I'm going to just talk about three general types of um, author agreements. The first and most restrictive is a complete copyright transfer. I've mentioned this. This is when a publisher agrees to publish your work, but in so doing says you need to sign over all of your rights. This is still happening. It used to be the only model. And now that more models are being introduced, it's not, the, it's not a monolithic publishing model, but it still is a, it's a fairly popular model of publication. The second less restrictive way to think about this is you do transfer over all your copyright to the publisher, but then the publisher returns specific rights to you via a license. I'm gonna show you a way of negotiating that sort of relationship in a moment. 
But this is a way to get back, as I mentioned, those rights that maybe the publisher isn't even ex interested in exercising that might be really useful for you. And the third option is that you retain the copyright and you, in fact, grant the publisher a non-exclusive license to publish. And this is a popular model in open access publishing. And something to know when you're going into thinking about these options, if you have ever um, signed an author agreement or, or not even, if you aren't familiar with it, some things to know are that you may be limited in your ability to, for instance, share your work on your own website or control any translations of your work. You may not be able to deposit your work in your university's institutional repository. And you may have to seek permission from the publisher to reuse your own scholarship in any future work you do. So these are things that I think sometimes authors aren't aware that they are signing away. So it's important to know this, and if any of these rights are important to you, to feel empowered to discuss this with any future publisher. One way that you can do this is by using an author addendum. I'm listing here the Spark author addendum, and when we provide these slides to you, um, this is a link, so you'll be able to look at that. I, I'm going to try to look at it in a moment, and we'll see how successful I am. Um, systems like the University of California and the University of Michigan have their own addendums, author addendums, for authors to submit to publishers. But the CSU does not have its own addendum, so Spark is a great one to use. And just to give you a sense of what this looks like, Really, four through six list the kinds of things you might be interested in negotiating with the publisher. Retention of specific rights, um, the publisher providing you with a PDF of the version of record. Many publishers will not allow this, but some will. And so you could negotiate for that to put into an institutional repository. And a publisher acknowledging that you may have prior agreements with either your institution or a funding agency and recognizing and abiding by those agreements. So those are just some of the things. Obviously, you could take a Spark addendum and modify it if you had other considerations that you wanted um, a publisher to consider. The next tool I want to talk about is a way to see, prior to ever submitting your um, manuscript for publication, you can look into, much like Carolyn was showing you how to evaluate journals, you can evaluate a journal's open access policies and their self-archiving policies. And you can do that using this tool called Sherpa Romeo. And I've provided a link here in the slide so you can go and test this out yourself, but I just did some screenshots to show you what it would look like. So for instance, right here, you can enter the name of a journal. I just put in Nature as a general journal to look at. And when I did, I could go through and confirm the ISSN if the journal, if there were many journals with a similar name to make sure that I was looking at the appropriate or correct journal. And it gives me a readout that I can um, look at according to this key. So for instance, nature is yellow. And I see just looking at the, the initial key that yellow means I can archive a preprint, which is um, prior to peer review. That is the definition of preprint that is being used in Sherpa Romeo. So what that means is basically the accepted manuscript. They would allow you to put that in an institutional repository. If I wanted more information about what yellow means for nature, I could click on it and you'll see that actually there are quite a few general conditions here. And it's very um, useful to, to read those and not just go by the initial screen. So you see that you can archive the preprint, but it is subject to restrictions below. And you cannot archive the publisher's version, the version of record. So you could go through and look at the particular journal you were interested in submitting to and see what their um, policies were with regard to uh, self-archiving and open access. So that's just another tool to use in evaluating a journal. The final area I want to touch on is um, our own institutional repository. Zoomingus Hill did not have an institutional repository prior to this year, but we are participating in the CSU-wide repository system called ScholarWorks. And this is very exciting for us because not only are we going to be able to archive um, the electronic uh, theses that students are completing, but importantly, as you see here, we're going to be able to archive faculty publications. 
So faculty deposits are coming soon. And I say this because we are working out the final kinks in the metadata and using the theses, which are an easier batch of um, deposits to work on. We're using those to make sure that the system is functioning you know, as it should be. And then we'll be opening this up and we'll be uh, publicizing it broadly on campus. We'll be opening up ScholarWorks for faculty deposit, which means you'll be able to provide the library with your research depending on what the um, publisher allows. So for instance, a preprint or a postprint. So a preprint I mentioned was um, an accepted manuscript. A postprint can be a document that has gone through peer review and you can incorporate those changes and provide that as a postprint. Some publishers will allow you to then also use the formatting that they have provided. Other publishers will not. So it may just be the manuscript post review. Also, there's an asterisk here because not all publishers allow this, but some publishers allow you to submit to the repository the version of record. So this is really exciting for faculty on our campus. Also, I want to mention data sets. And I want to talk a little bit about why you would want to deposit your research and scholarship and scholar work. Why, why bother with this? You've published it. It's out there. Everyone can see it. Why would you go ahead and take that next step of depositing it in our repository? And there are many reasons. But just some of the reasons are the ability to self-archive your work and make it widely available even to those researchers and individuals who are unable to access research that exists behind a paywall. Much of your scholarship, when libraries subscribe to it, we are paying for it. And for people who don't have access to those resources and those databases, you're now making your research and scholarship available to them. And this can impact people internationally. This can impact people, individuals who are looking for information. So it's an important consideration in making your scholarship more widely available. Also, the repository provides enhanced visibility and discoverability of your research. So while it's great that you've published this article and it's available in a journal, this is a whole new way of people finding your research. Another very important consideration is that the repository engages in preservation practices. So we are working to ensure that your digital scholarship remains accessible and persistent. I'm sure you've encountered broken links and the like, and we're working very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen when someone clicks on your research. And finally, it part you can participate in raising the profile of the California State University system. We have a lot of great research happening on our campuses, and by bringing it together and providing a place where people can see the breadth of scholarship that's happening, it raises the profile of the CSU. So with that, I think we can open this up for questions. Yeah, real quick before we open it to questions, um, could I share my screen again, Dana? Sure. Um, I want to show you where you can all get more um, resources. You know, this is just one short webinar. Um, so where, where there's more um, resources available for you. And that's going to be through our research guides um, on the library's website. Um, so this is our research help page on the library's website. And um, we have a bunch of research guides. You may have given these to your students. Um, we have them by major, so um, they're a great place to provide resources to students doing research. But we also have this section on scholarly communication um, that's much more geared towards you. And here you can see we have information per, uh, discussing everything we've talked about today, from author's rights to copyright to, for example, those journal metrics. Um, we only talked about a few of those different journal metrics today, H-index, things like that. Um, you'll find more on these guides, as well as author metrics you can uh, keep in touch with and things like that. So you'll find all of those guides, again, on that research help page. 